Okay, so I've just been told I'm on. Hi, I would like to welcome all of you to Health, Immunity, and Food, Mitigating the Effects of COVID-19. Um, the title basically sums up what we will be talking about. It's about how we can use food to better our health in order to boost our immune system, which hopefully can help us lessen the effects of COVID-19. I'm Diane Hatz. Uh, I've been a healthy food advocate for over 20 years uh, in various capacities, and I am currently the founder and executive director of Change Food, which is our lead nonprofit partner, as well as the founder and head of Boma Grow USA. So we are a division of Boma Global, Boma Global is a worldwide network of change makers and action takers that put on transformational experiences to not only educate and inform, but to also take action to create positive change to help reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Can you tell how excited I am to be part of it? Um, it's fairly new here in the U.S., so you might not be familiar with it, but you know about it now. So, Boma Grow USA is focused specifically on regenerative food and farming. Um, we're looking to see how we can build a food system that's healthy, it's inclusive and healthy for people, animals, and the planet. Our nonprofit lead, our lead nonprofit partner, Change Food, same thing, has the same goals. So Change Food's latest program is called Plant, Eat, Share. It's an effort to pull together um, different programs that have been happening around the world to plant food in public spaces for people to eat for free. I'm very excited about it. We will have a lot more in the future about it. Today, we're focused on what we can do to help build our immune system so that we can better handle the coronavirus should we come down with it. Now, experts are predicting that 60 to 70% of the global population will be infected with the virus at some point. So the way I look at it, it's more a case of when we will get it, not if we will get it. And our first guest, is the best person I think on the planet to discuss this issue. He's an expert in the area of health, immunity, and food. Dr. William Lee is a world-renowned physician, scientist, speaker, and author of Eat to Beat Disease, the new science of how your body can heal itself. His groundbreaking work has impacted more than 70 diseases, including cancer, diabetes, blindness, heart disease, and obesity. His TED Talk, can We Eat to Starve Cancer has garnered more than 11 million views. He is best known for leading the Angiogenesis Foundation. Dr. Lee, welcome. Thank you, Diane. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always good to see you. So your resume is so inspiring. I had to cut it really short for this. But to start off, can you tell us what is the Angiogenesis Foundation and how did it all come about, like the work you do? Well, I'm a physician, a scientist, and an author. Um, and my background is in internal medicine, and as a scientist, my background is in a field called angiogenesis, and that's a fancy word that refers to the growth of blood vessels in the body. Um, I gave a TED Talk about uh, my work, but angiogenesis, blood vessels actually form a 60,000-mile series of conduits that are packed wow. under our skin, and they brings blood, oxygen, nutrients to every cell in our body. To some extent, it's totally aligned with what BOMA does, which is to actually help feed the world inside our body. Uh, in 1994, 25 years ago, I became really interested in uh, understanding what are common denominators of health and disease. Because we could have an economy of scale, if we could pull the uh, bow back and send a single arrow through things that made diseases the same, and mm -hmm. also to support things that made health in all of its attributes the same. So we found that angiogenesis, blood vessel growth, healthy circulation is one of those things. And uh, over the course of 25 years, we helped to develop 34 FDA approved treatments. But wow. about 10 years ago, I realized that treatments really were the end stage of the game, but we should really do prevention instead. And that's where I expanded my worldview to begin using the same tools of biotechnology, but instead began to study what foods do in the body. So when it comes to food and health, it's not so much about um, uh, just the food, it's about how our body responds to it. So how did you come across food? Like why food and not exercise or something else? Like why was it food? Well, my own background is that I did a gap year between college and medical school, and I was really interested in 
um, something that is now known as the Mediterranean diet. I actually um, spent time living in Italy and in Greece, in the islands and traveling in villages, understanding how food and, uh, and uh, what is grown around people, the, the agriculture, um, that, that was largely done in a regenerative way actually informed every single day life. And I was trying to connect that back to um, quality of life, um, uh, lifestyle, uh, longevity, and also how that led to the birth of, you know, um, the arts, whether it's painting or sculpture or philosophy and writing. Um, So I think, you know, food is one of these common threads, kind of like music, that unites all people. And I felt that if we wanted to take a look at something that could both prevent um, and treat disease, but also try to restore our health, because pharmaceuticals and what doctors are traditionally trying to do is just to, you know, chase down the disease and harpoon it. But really what we want to do is more cyclical in nature. We want to keep our health, but when we start to see it slip, we want to actually regenerate it to back where it needs to be. And that, that's really where food comes in. Right. Regenerate, that's the key word for today. So tell us about Eat to Beat Disease. How did it come about? Why should we all read it? Give us a little update and background on it. Well, I you know, had this great career um, doing drug development in biotechnology, and it took about 10 years for many of the drugs to actually go from twinkle in the eye to actual FDA approval. And uh, I was really fortunate because we did, we actually did a lot of parallel uh, treatments um, uh, all at the same time. So a a lot of them started to appear in in short um, sequence. But I really realized that um, pharmaceuticals and biotechnologies are really far away from the average person. And even Mm -hmm. frankly, from the medical community. But food has immediacy. Something you learn about food, something I learned about food, is something that I can put into action right away. The next time that I open the refrigerator, go to the pantry, or go to the market. And I happen to do all of those you know, regularly, like I think most people do. And I felt that writing a book uh, for the public would actually allow me to help empower people to be able to take action themselves in ways that are informed by science. So I do the research. People don't need to know all the nitty gritties if they're not mm-hmm. interested. If they are interested, I'd love to talk about it. But honestly, it boils down to simple things. What choices do I make? And so much about food and health and nutrition has traditionally been about uh, elimination, deprivation, fear, guilt, and shame, uh, judgment. And what I wanted to do was to write a book about how you can lean into your food, love your food in order to love your health. And that's what Eat to Beat Disease is all about. Fantastic. So... We've asked Dr. Lee to put together a short talk just about viruses and immunity because, I mean, to be honest, I wasn't really sure the link and how this all worked. Um, so, Dr. Lee, would you like to set it up before we show it? Do you have anything you want to lead into with it? Well, so I um, study blood vessels and I also write about food and health. But about um, three weeks ago, I decided that um, it was time for me to dive in and don my medical researcher's hat and just um, plunge into unraveling the enigma of COVID-19. And so Mm -hmm. this video um, that you're about to see is really just a bit of an overview of what I've learned about COVID-19 in ways that I think everybody needs to understand. Fantastic. Brendan, can we show the first clip? COVID-19 is a virus that's brought an entire civilization to its knees. After 200,000 years of human existence, we have finally met our match, or have we? We got a lot to learn from history, and pandemics, which are an infection that can infect an entire nation or an entire world, have been with us for a very long time. In fact, in the 1600s, the great plague swept through Europe. In the city of Venice, it sent all of its inhabitants scrambling into their stone houses waiting for the town crier to let them know when it was safe to come back out again. Fast forward almost 400 years, and we have the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or COVID-19. This is a coronavirus, which is the type of virus that causes the common cold, and is closer related to a cold than it is to a flu. Coronavirus here is actually infecting a white blood cell, and it is a respiratory virus 
that can infect us all. And when I say all, I mean the entire world. Uh, this is actually just a dashboard showing all the regions of the world, uh, almost 200 countries that have been affected by COVID-19. And literally it has brought everything, every city to a standstill. But throughout history, we have always been encountering periodically gigantic public health scourges going all the way back to the first century uh, AD. And in fact, if you were to take a look at the mortality of these, uh, you can see where we stand today. The Black Death caused 200 million deaths, smallpox, 56 million, Spanish flu, which is often invoked now, 40 to 50 million. And where are we today? We are down here. SARS COVID-19, uh, COVID we are second only to the 18th century great plagues of Europe. Put another way, we've had more than 90,000 deaths in the United States from COVID-19. And when you compare this to the deaths from, of US military servicemen, uh, it's greater than Vietnam, World War I, and the Korean War. So we're talking about a lot of people who have died in just a few months. What are we learning actually about COVID-19 uh, that allow us to actually have some understanding? Understanding gives us power. Well, we know that COVID-19 is a respiratory virus. We inhale it, it comes through the air, through air droplets, water droplets, that actually come to our nose. The battle is mostly fought with our immune system in our noses, but if we can't win that war right at the point of entry, then the virus can gain entry into our lungs where it actually causes a huge amount of damage, inflammation, pneumonia, and it makes a beeline for blood vessels in our lung. As it enters our blood vessels, it can actually invade everywhere in our body, including our heart, and we're seeing damage from COVID-19 in lots of blood vessels, uh, and sometimes it's manifest as blood clotting that can cause serious problems and death. COVID-19 has even been found to affect the brain, where it actually can cause different types of syndromes uh, beyond headache, uh, confusion, uh, inflammation, strokes, even seizures. And this is actually a picture where you can see the arrows pointing to what we call encephalopathy, unusual swelling of the brain. We don't understand all the aspects of this enigma called COVID-19, but what, one thing we do know is that we actually have to find a vaccine that can uh, protect, protect us against it as a population. Beyond a vaccine, we need effective treatments. Before we get there, we have to have adequate immune defenses. And then what we've been doing so far is trying to avoid the virus, which is by sheltering in place or hiding. The last two aren't really good solutions. So our first line of defense is going to be our immune defenses. In essence, we are locked in an epic war between our body and the virus. What's going on inside of our bodies and the virus trying to invade us from the outside. And the good news is that we can actually do something about it because we can actually boost our immune defenses. Okay, that is so scary. I don't want to be alarmist, but I'm so scared now. So when the pandemic first started, we all heard that it was a disease that was geared toward older people but that doesn't seem to be the case any longer. So what's happened and what is the current status on who COVID-19 affects? Right, in only five months time, we've actually gone from knowing almost zero about this novel coronavirus. So 200,000 years of human existence, um, we actually hadn't encountered this pathogen before. But now that we have, we're beginning to really understand what we initially observed, in fact, was just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg. And that was the older people, the more vulnerable people, the people with comorbidities, the diabetes, the um, uh, serious heart and lung diseases that were actually the fallen soldiers in the beginning. As we now have 4 million people worldwide who have been affected, we are actually getting a really a much broader look. And that's you know basically basic statistics. When you have a sample size of a small number, you see the most prominent ones. When you've got this mass to be able to examine, you start seeing where the truth emerges. Here's the truth about COVID-19. While older people are more vulnerable and people with uh, chronic illnesses are more vulnerable, we now realize that pretty much everybody is vulnerable, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're youthful in your 20s, 
and even children can be affected. And as you said at the very beginning, you know, our expectation is that, you know, somewhere about uh, 70 to 80% of people will eventually be infected. And, you know, if I told you that about the common cold, you wouldn't actually worry about it. Or maybe even the flu, because we can get over it. And I think that's where we're headed eventually with COVID-19 is that we will start to get used to it. Our bodies will evolve to get used to it. And then it'll be something that we kind of just deal with in our environments. What do we know is that uh, this is a respiratory virus that does actually cause respiratory infections, but because we're seeing not just differences in age, but differences beyond the lung, we're seeing our hearts infected, we're seeing blood clots in our lungs, in our legs, um, we're seeing COVID toe. You know, what the heck is that? That's actually, you know, this inflamed red um, area of, of, of probably inflamed blood vessels at the end, you know, um, uh, sort of at the tips of our toes that can actually reflect the virus causing problems there and also in our brain, in our kidneys, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that I think that we're beginning to realize is that um, blood thinners actually can be protective if people are in a hospital, number one. Number two, that some of the treatments that we initially thought of may wind up have to, uh, the, the sort of the best case treatments might need to, be, that list might need to be revised as we understand more about this uh, uh, virus as well. And so I would say this is a stay tuned, look for the evidence, you know, trust the people who are actually doing the research, trust the data, you know, the old adage, in God we trust, all others bring data. That's something that I abide by. And then finally, I mean, I think that the, uh, uh, the, the amazing work of medical research is uh, uh, plowing forward faster than we've ever seen in modern history. I mean, if you think about you know, the race to the moon, the space race. This is probably an order of 10 faster in terms of everybody galvanizing their uh, mm -hmm. focus on this to try to solve the problem as scientists. We're beginning to see treatments um, that, that show promise at least in slowing down the disease and speeding up recovery. Uh, the first indications um, of, of a vaccine able to produce the right type of antibodies response is coming out. I mean, think about that. This is five months time from zero to where we are actually at. Um, everybody's impatient. Uh, I can't wait for a clear solution to be found. But these complicated um, uh, diseases and health issues are rarely solved with a magic bullet. So in the meantime, I think what's really important for us, for us to um, uh, pay really close attention to best practices. And at this moment in time, staying safe is still going to be the backbone of how to actually beat this disease. So you know, essentially you're saying that the coronavirus is not just going to go away. There's no magic bullets. So is a vaccine the only solution? You know, is there anything else that we can think about or look toward or try to do? Right. So here's the thing. Um, vaccines uh, are incredibly important. We use them for smallpox and polio and, uh, and typhoid and hepatitis. Kind of the holy grail, um, I think, of modern medicine and modern health. Uh, but again, it is that old kind of um, canon of pharmaceuticals that are out there. Treatments tend to be, um, what's the right word, temporizing. You know, uh, we tend to throw treatments when the horses come out of the barn. The other, um, and the treatments can be new treatments or they could be old treatments. So repurposing old medicines um, gives a lot of people options that are less expensive and more affordable. And the safety tends to be um, better known as well. But I'm particularly excited by uh, a, a new frontier that I think is going to not be temporary, it's going to stay with us. And that is how we can actually take charge of our own life and lifestyles, our diet, our sleep, our stress management. If there's ever been a moment in the health community where uh, patients, the public, and physicians alike have suddenly realized that you know the threat that we've always thought coming from inside us, the heart disease, the diabetes, the stroke, um, all, all, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that, that you know, we, we need to do better, we need to eat healthier. Now we have suddenly have this um, threat from the outside, the external world, that is um, so huge, it's become an existential threat to humanity. And I think it's, it's led all of us to pause and reconsider what health means. And actually health starts in our kitchen, on our dinner plates. Um, on the foods that we actually choose. And so, you know, back to the thesis I started with, which is that we can eat to beat disease. And it starts when we're born, 
and it goes all the way until our very last breath, you know, the, our last meal, um, uh, something that we can do to actually help support our body's health defenses is something that is so important for us to all to think about. One of the things that a lot of people, and I especially, am concerned about and interested in is that you know, there's always a claim every week chocolate, green tea. And I know some of it is really good for you, but there's always a claim of something else. And I went, got to a point where I got a little obsessive and I can't tell you how many tinctures and roots and herbs. And I'm just like, I had to stop at some point. So, you know, we really are for a lot of people, we're in a life and death situation right now. Is there evidence, is there scientific research-based evidence that certain foods or types of foods outperform others and do help? Absolutely. And, uh, I think that there is so much noise, the surround sound about food and health has been so confusing to so many of us. I mean, that's really how I got into this really is that when my patient would ask me, hey doc, what can I do for myself? And I realized I wasn't taught in medical school and yet these patients were counting on me to answer almost every other question they had about their health, but I didn't have the, the, the science. I didn't have the education to talk about nutrition. I felt that was wrong. And so what I did is I went back and I looked at what is the scientific underpinnings, not of nutrition of the 1930s or the 40s, not vitamins, not um, trying to undernourish and, and to replenish you know, and supplement uh, malnourishment, uh, malnutrition. But what do we know at the forefront? And the result is really surprising, which is that we know there are certain foods when it comes to immunity that if we're short of those micronutrients, our immune system actually is compromised. So you got to actually eat some of that stuff just to get back to baseline. And the amazing thing is that you can be undernourished even when you're surrounded by food if you don't make the right choices. And then the second part is really, again, this is in my wheelhouse. How do we take the sizzling methodologies of biotechnology that you read about in the Wall Street Journal and all these other you know, um, uh, biotech breakthroughs, how do we actually not just look at the pharmaceuticals, but how do we look at the pharmaceuticals, meaning mm. taking what, we, what Mother Nature has delivered to us? And by the way, most drugs that are out there originally came from plants, the ones right. that were commonly used. And so how do we actually bring back this old notion that Mother Nature is much more clever than man, no matter how many times we try to CRISPR something or come up with some gene edit, you know, gene uh, manipulation. The reality is, is that almost every food we have is made up of tens of thousands of natural chemicals, really, that are uh, interact with our bodies. And so how do we study that? That's where the actual science comes from. And that's really what I actually think everybody needs to know about immunity. Fantastic. So that's a great lead into your next little clip. Is there anything you want to say to set it up? Or do you want to just roll right into it? Why don't we just roll right in? Okay, Brendan, let's do video number two from Dr. Lee. Food is medicine a phrase many of us have heard, but not many understand. Because yes, food is healthy, but how do we know that it actually works in our body? Well, the answers are coming from the biotechnology community, because over the last 25 years, more than 800 drugs have been approved by the FDA using methods and testing systems that have demonstrated how a drug that we introduce into our body actually has an effect. Now imagine if we actually used foods and studied it in these systems to see how foods actually interact on our health defense systems. These are defenses that are actually activated by pathways inside our cells, connecting our organs, and controlling how well we actually are able to resist disease. Foods can actually activate health defense systems like angiogenesis, our circulation or help protect our DNA, or influence our stem cells to be able to prompt regeneration, healing from the inside out, or help us have a better gut microbiome, our healthy bacteria, and even prompt our immune system, which is really the focus in the era of COVID-19. So here are 10 things you should eat that science has shown us can activate our immune health defenses. Let's start with the first one, tomatoes. Tomatoes are a good source of vitamin C, and besides being delicious to eat, we know that deficiencies in vitamin C can actually make one more vulnerable to virus infections. So here's a way to actually boost your support your immunity 
with tomatoes. And it could be a whole tomato, it could be a cherry tomato, a big one, a small one. It could be tomato paste, tomato sauce, even tomato powder. So the next time you open your recipe book, look for tomato recipes. Mushrooms, a great source of vitamin D and a bioactive called beta-glucan. We know that deficiencies in vitamin D actually can make you more vulnerable to infection. So here's a great way to actually have uh, not only delicious food, but also to support your immune system. Beta-glucan actually activates the antibodies in our saliva that can protect us against virus infections. Broccoli sprouts. This is not your mother's broccoli on a plate, but rather three to four day old baby broccoli that have been studied in the context of actually influenza vaccines. And we know that actually if you have broccoli sprouts, even given as a shake, you can actually boost your body's immune cells, your natural killer T cells by more than 22 times. That's a pretty good boost by having a shake. Olive oil has been studied in humans and also found to activate our immune system's T cells. These are the actual soldiers that tackle a virus. And we know that there is a bioactive in olive oil called hydroxytyrosol that is much higher in the extra version form of olive oil. Next up, blueberries and blackberries. They have this beautiful color due to a natural dye that's called anthocyanins. And these have been shown to actually amplify your body's immune natural killer cells. Again, the cells that tackle viruses. Who wouldn't want to actually eat something like this? Next up, a surprise, oysters. Oysters have been studied by cancer researchers for their ability to amplify the immune response against cancer cells. And one of the things that has been discovered is that Extracts from oysters can actually improve the size of your immune organs, like your spleen, your thymus, and amplify, again, those natural killer immune cells. This is an instance where size does actually matter. Not everybody likes oysters, but you can always get oysters through oyster sauce, which is a delicious way to actually dress up your vegetables. Now let's talk about, about the microbiome. This is healthy gut bacteria. We know that our gut bacteria actually talks to our immune system and helps to actually give it air traffic control instructions. How does the immune system actually work? We know that there's 37 trillion bacteria that live in our gut, and most of them are actually good guys that help uh, control our functions from our brain to our immunity, to our skin and our metabolism. We also know that our gut, good healthy gut bacteria can control our immune system. And this has been studied, again, by cancer researchers who have found one bacteria in the gut called Acromancia mucinophila. Acromancia is a normal, natural, healthy gut bacteria that loves to live in the mucus, hence mucinophilia, in our guts. So we've got normal, healthy gut bacteria living in our mucus. And when you have pomegranates, the juices actually cause our gut to secrete more mucus, which allows the bacteria to grow, which can then amplify our immune response. The great news is we can actually get this mucus generating bacteria, acromancia fostering effect just with, by drinking uh, pomegranate juice. Green tea, we know that green tea lowers stress, lowers anxiety, lowers cholesterol, but now we know that it actually can raise our bacteria is called lactobacillus, which then boosts a virus-fighting cytokine called interferon gamma. We've heard about cytokine storms in the COVID-19 crisis, but actually not all cytokines are bad. When it comes to interferon, this particular cytokine is designed to kill viruses. So green tea contains EGCG, which helps grow bacteria, which amplifies our antiviral-fighting properties. Pecans, one of my favorite tree nuts. Great for a snack, great for cooking, you can add to a salad, even to a pasta. Pecans are actually a great source of dietary fiber and our gut bacteria loves to eat that fiber and actually use it to metabolize and create other fragments, but we don't digest, the bacteria digest, and those fragments can actually boost our immunity. Pecans also are a good source of polyunsaturated fatty acids, good fats, and it's been studied now to show that it can increase a bacteria called ruminococcus, which again, guess what? 
increases interferon gamma, the virus killing cytokine. A great snack that can help us have a better immune system. And that's 10 foods that can actually help support our immune system, supported by researchers looking at the key parts of the immune system that could be helpful against infection, specifically viruses. It's possible to eat to beat disease, and I've written about more than 200 foods in my book. Please check out more information that I'm presenting on my website, drwilliamlee.com, or you can find me on social at Dr. William Lee. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. So I have questions, but we have questions that are coming in from the audience too, so I'm going to intersperse them. Um, the first one I'm going to ask you is from Cheryl. She says, I have a question about tomatoes. I just had the microbiome in my gut analyzed, and it turns out I have a tomato virus in my gut. So they recommend I avoid tomatoes because they could cause an inflammatory response in my body as long as I have this tomato virus. Could you explain this? Well, uh, every individual is different, and this is uh, what we're really um, starting to um, really get our arms around, this, this individualization or personalization of nutrition. So uh, what's amazing is that in medicine, uh, when I went to medical school and training, they kind of teach us one size fits all. But we all know when it comes to food and health, one size doesn't fit all. So some people may actually have an intolerance to certain foods, whether it's gluten, whether it's peanuts and, or soybeans. You know, there's lots of these food intolerances. Um, and tomatoes actually have a number of different factors that some people don't respond very well to. And so what I think is that if you actually have personal experience uh, with eating any food, uh, even the healthy ones that you actually know better than anyone else when it doesn't work well for you. You might feel itchy or nauseous or have, you know, belly discomfort um, or loose stools, diarrhea, you know, like that's the time to take note of it. So I encourage people to actually write down in a little diary or put into your uh, mobile phone a note of all the foods that you don't quite agree with. It's true that the gut microbiome is the other kind of layer the onion we're peeling back. Some people might actually be perfectly able to tolerate a food, but they don't have the right bacteria to help them digest it. And so one of the things that I encourage you to do is to actually see if there's a way of right-sizing the microbiome to the extent that we know how by having fermented foods, by actually having prebiotics, take some probiotics. Um, uh, those are ways that you might actually take an intolerance that you have now, uh, and it might be to tomatoes or something else, and really see if uh, by taking better care of your gut bacteria, um, you might actually be able to get back and start eating um, uh, other foods that you didn't think that you could eat before. When it comes to tomatoes, um, look, it's, it's a great source of vitamin C. There's a lot of other great sources of vitamin C as well. It's very unlikely you're allergic to vitamin C. Um, Sophia, so um, here's what I would say. Guava has got a ton of vitamin C. Uh, oranges, citrus have a ton of vitamin C. So you're not out of options here. Um, if you're really trying to boost, boost your, de uh, your defenses and tomatoes don't, uh, don't cut it for you, um, all you got to do is to look for another source. Well, that sort of leads into a question I had about the tomatoes, because you talked about the vitamin C. So is it the tomato? Because I know tomato has lycopene and other things in it. So is it the vitamin C or is it the tomato? Like, could I have an orange? Like, what is it about tomato and why you chose that? Right. Well, I chose tomatoes because I love tomatoes, and I think they're so great. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> with different kinds of foods. But I will tell you that um, they are a, um, a versatile food. I think it's really important, by the way, when we talk about food and health, to look for things that are um, common, uh, accessible, affordable, and actually have versatility in cuisine, right? So I could pick something very particular out that actually is helpful, like sea cucumbers, for example. But that's not a particularly versatile food. I think fruits and vegetables, whole plant-based foods, um, legumes, nuts, they tend to lend themselves to all kinds of things. You are absolutely right that although we tend to assign particular value to vitamin C um, or lycopene, depending on you know, who you're listening to, foods have, as I mentioned earlier, tens of thousands of, of goodies to them. You know, it, it literally any single food is like a, you know, it's like a kid in the candy store without all their sugar. <laughs> um, you've got all, we've got this, um, this, uh, uh, this cornucopia of goodness. And, and probably we haven't even discovered all the good things that are in it. Right. What I think that is important to do when you look at the abundance of evidence of food and health, you do want to actually look at 
Um, what are we doing in the lab that something in the food actually does to human cells? Are there animal models or other models that actually can demonstrate a mechanism of action? That's how we actually try to define things. Scientifically, are there clinical studies, even small numbers of patients? Are there groups of studies, uh, groups of people we're studying? And then are there large population studies that are out there? And when you actually combine this entire repertoire of evidence together, it becomes really clear that, you know, honestly, these whole plant-based foods indeed actually shine. But that to me is, is only the beginning because rather than just take a dietary supplement or a vitamin to sort of, mm -hmm. you know, go for your magic bullet, what I think is that we're all um, informed, our food choices, we all individually um, are shaped by our upbringing, our families, our culture, uh, our own preferences, maybe our gut microbiome. Lean into the things that you love that are healthy, and then you're way ahead of the game because you're starting with the things that you already enjoy. So this ties in. Dusky has a question, and I had the same one about the pecans, which is very similar to the tomato question. So Dusky asks, are there other nuts that help in addition to pecans? And I added to that, and you talk about the fiber in the pecans. What about psyllium powder? Like our nut, you know, and I also, I have walnuts in the fridge. I don't have pecans. So what's your take on pecans specifically? Yeah, well, again, I love pecans. Um, uh, they represent uh, kind of the uh, family of tree nuts. And mm. there's so many tree nuts, cashews, almonds, <clears throat> pistachios, uh, macadamia, uh, pine nuts, all good. Um, you know, and, and every nut has its own particular flavor that you might like better. Perhaps you like walnuts better uh, than pecans. And that's just great because actually most nuts are packed with um, fiber. Uh, dietary fiber, and they're a good source of healthy fats as well. Easy to snack on. They keep for a reasonable long period of time, either in your pantry or in your refrigerator. You can even freeze nuts if you really wanted to. You can make a pesto out of them, you know? And, and so I think that, uh, the, and, and the idea is really not to get stuck on only particular identities of food, but understand it's the category of food. So the 10, the 10 foods in my video that I showed you are really, um, you know, people like to have lists. So a top 10 list, tomatoes are really kind of like an archetype for vitamin C containing uh, foods, but there are so many good ones and other good things in tomatoes besides vitamin C. Pecans, one of my favorites, you know, um, I put it on a menu because it's something I really enjoy myself. Um, I eat them frequently, but it really, it really belong to tree nuts. And I would say if you love tree nuts, don't have an allergy to them, lean into them. And also the other thing I, I would sort of just say is that this is an early, this is, you know, uh, we've known about healthy foods for a long time, but at the level that I'm talking about, we are still just at the beginning of the, the tip of the iceberg of doing the research on understanding just what foods can do. Next yeah. frontiers are going to be mixing foods together. What about food combinations? Um, how do you cook the food? Where do they grow? The climate changes, you know, um, organic versus non-organic, GMO versus not. So many great questions that we need to answer. But look, we are in this COVID-19 era. We are all trying to figure out how to gain control of our lives when, at a time when we felt like we lost control. And so one of the things I would say is that if you like nuts, if you like tomatoes, if you like any of those foods, that's a great start. If you want more foods, just come to my website because um, I'm actually putting up more and more lists of foods that okay. we're discovering. It's drwilliamlee.com, drwilliamlee.com. Sign up and you know, I'd love to actually be able to you know, just keep on pumping out information for people. This is news you can use. So Minati asks, how does someone define what is a healthy gut bacteria? Also, from her understanding, people who have chronic inflammatory conditions such as diabetes, food is not enough and supplementation is needed. Do you have any comments or thoughts about that? Both really great, great questions. Um, the question of what constitutes a healthy gut microbiome is still very much being uh, researched right now. Uh, we do know that uh, the body has you know, trillions, 37 trillion uh, uh, bacteria. That's a lot of bacteria. Um, uh, that's a ton of species too, a lot of different types of bacteria. Think of it as an ecosystem. I, I sort of have been explaining to uh, folks like the Great Barrier Reef, this beautiful complex system that's got so many organisms around it, we can't even count them. And we haven't, there are organisms we haven't discovered yet. Um, what's really interesting in COVID-19 is that there are some uh, early studies beginning to take a look at what types of foods are connected to what types of gut bacteria, like the lactobacillus or the ruminococcus, 
that are connected to immune um, uh, supporting mm. cytokines, good cytokines in this case, like interferon gamma, that might be protective against viral infections for people that actually don't get sick quite as seriously. And so again, we don't know the exact actors and players of the whole microbiome yet. And so I actually encourage people, if you're getting your microbiome tested, just realize that we're, this is a moment in time, we're taking a dipstick into what we know, and I'm sure you know, the information we have is gonna to continue to change uh, over time. So this is, this is a, on a different topic. Uh, as the general public, how do we avoid all of the false information out there? And we know there's a lot of it. Information is power, and the internet has given us all this incredible ability to uh, consume information 24 seven. And in a situation that is uh, uh, an emergency, like this pandemic with COVID-19, where a virus took us by surprise. I mean, we were all going about our normal lab, uh, lives, uh, our little normal work, and suddenly we got sideswiped, rammed uh, by this giant uh, uh, disaster. And then the, the news starts pounding out. Um, it doesn't help that, you know, people that we should trust don't give us necessarily credible news. And of course, then everybody wants to pro provide um, their own interpretation of news. I know that there's sort of a general erosion of trust in experts, but I can tell you as somebody who is studying the, the COVID-19 and studying diet and health and studying, you know, um, medicines themselves that the real um, trustworthy people that talk about the disease are the ones who basically first tell you that we don't know everything. Humility in the face of the great unknown is an important um, signal for truth tellers, to be honest with you. Anybody who's so confident that they basically are telling you it's gotta be this way and we now right. get the final answer, those are the sources that you know. I think you have to be a little careful about. Um, right now, one of the interesting things is that medical research um, is being pounded out on COVID-19 in all kinds of different ways. And in fact, journals have lifted their paywalls. Hallelujah. It's, and now you don't have to pay $30 an article to a publisher for publicly funded research results. Um, but at the same time, they've also lifted um, uh, peer review in order to allow information to come out. So even within the scientific community, forget about the marketeers and the, you know, the talking heads and the you know, soapbox influencers and the voodoo medicine people, even among the scientific community, we've actually had to up our own game of being able to be buyer beware of the information that's out there. So I would say um, uh, pe people that are trustworthy tend to be um, really honest about what they know and what they don't know. They tend to have a track record. So look for people who actually have an established track record of doing things that are trustworthy. Um, uh, look for the evidence and data. Um, and recognize that at least in this pandemic, the evidence changes um, continuously because there's so much going on. So if you're actually um, uh, trying to find who's reliable, go for the people that are actually um, giving you the updated information and the reinterpretation of what we saw. At, at the very beginning, we talked about you know COVID-19 being a disease of elderly people. Well, we've had to revise that view. And I think that that's another um, uh, hallmark of, of, of just how um, really credible information works is we got to adapt to the times. We got to adapt to the evidence. So Alex's question segues into this. I mean, he asks, "Do your top ten foods have clinical research supporting them? Is there clinical research or other studies out there that support that these foods do build your immune system?" Absolutely. Um, all those foods that I showed you actually have a published um, uh, uh, background, uh, peer-reviewed in journals, and actually most of them actually are on human studies, like the tomatoes and the uh, based on population studies, the, um, uh, the broccoli sprouts done on a clinical trial, believe it or not, in people who actually were receiving the flu vaccine, and it could show that you could amplify your response, your immune response to a respiratory virus by 22 times um, in, a, in a study. Now, these aren't drug studies, uh, and yes, we can all do more research, but it constitutes evidence. Uh, and the same thing, you know, as the tree nuts, um, uh, uh, also uh, have backed heavily by uh, evidence. So I'm, uh, this is one of the things that I try to do through my website and in my book 
my book Eat to Beat Disease has got 700 references. So, you know, the references themselves, uh, the reference section is almost as thick as um, somebody else's book. Wow. So you mentioned broccoli sprouts. I don't see broccoli sprouts that often in the store. So can you eat broccoli? Like, are, are the sprouts just better, but is broccoli also still good? Great question, Diane. So among the tens of thousands of healthy natural chemicals that are um, uh, in, in broccoli and, and really the cruciferous vegetables, we know that the uh, sulforaphanes, um, which is a category of, of molecule, tend to be really, really concentrated um, in the baby ones, okay? The adult broccoli also has them, so they're good. Um, but the baby ones are concentrated, believe it or not, 100 times compared to wow. the, the, the older parents. Um, here's what also is interesting uh, about the, the, the adult broccoli. So you can eat the adult broccoli and get the, get the good stuff. Um, most of the people eat the treetops of the adult broccoli, right? Um, but it turns out if you go to the farmer's market, everybody knows that a broccoli is really mostly stem and a little bit of treetop. And when we've actually done research on broccoli anatomy to say what's in the treetops and what's in the stem, the treetops are great. They actually have a lot of, you know, um, uh, healthful properties for sure. We've documented that in really specific scientific studies and published it and presented it at the American Society of Nutrition meeting last year. But what's interesting is we found that the stalk has twice as much of the potent stuff. So wow. when you get, bring your broccoli home from the farmer's market, do eat the treetops because they're delicious, but save the stems and think about all the things you can do with them. You can actually put them in a smoothie. You can make a soup out of it. You can saute them. Again, versatility, put healthy food back into culture. I think that's really um, a great way to make food make sense. So I apologize. We've kept you over your time allotment because I'm so interested and I could go on forever. I apologize to everyone else who had a question. Um, we, we have to get Chef Amanda on because we're going to run out of time. But Dr. Lee, do you have anything you want to wrap up? Any comments? I'm having broccoli for dinner tonight. All I would say is that, um, you know, we are all in the same boat when it comes to COVID-19. This is the one event in human history that unifies everyone. The other thing that unifies everyone is our, eat, our, our food. And so what I would encourage us to do is to, you know, while we're kind of working out the issues with COVID um, uh, worldwide and take over time and get a vaccine, what I would say is now is the time for us individually, ourselves, our friends, our families, to work on how we can actually optimize and think about our health and our food in a new way. Fantastic. So everyone, a to beat disease. I don't normally hawk people's books, but I do think this book is fantastic. Um, we will also be sending everyone Dr. Lee's top 10 list laid out very nicely, and we will send you his contact information. So Dr. Lee, thank you so, so, so much. Um, I hope we can do this again soon. Would love to. Thanks, Diane. Thanks. Be well. And now, Brendan, let's bring on Chef Amanda. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to our very special second guest. This is Chef Amanda Cohen. Amanda Cohen is the James Beard nominated chef and owner of Dirt Candy, the award-winning vegetable restaurant on New York City's Lower East Side, and I've eaten there several times and it's amazing. She's also one of the Iron Chefs on Iron Chef Canada and is a board member and treasurer of Women Chefs and Restaurateurs. Amanda was the first vegetarian chef to compete on Iron Chef America and her comic cookbook, Dirt Candy, a cookbook, which I want to ask you questions about, is the first graphic novel cookbook to be published in North America. She also recently opened Lecca Burger in Tribeca in Manhattan. It's a fast, casual, vegan burger restaurant that makes burgers from five fresh vegetables. I bet we're not going to get those five vegetables from Amanda, but I cannot wait to try it. And finally, to connect, to connect Amanda into the Boma family, and I don't know if you know this, Chef Amanda, but... Um, Amanda graduated from the Natural Gourmet Institute. Amory Colvin founded the Natural Gourmet Institute. Her daughter, Kyla Colvin, is a co-founder of Boma Global, and Kyla put on the first Boma Grow in New Zealand last year. So it's a small world. Welcome. How Thank are you? Thank you for having me. So what did you think of Will's talk? Were you able to see any of it? Oh, yeah. I watched uh, most of it. it. It was terrific. You know, I, I know about food in a very specific way, and it's always enlightening to learn about it in a totally different way that is definitely outside my knowledge. So let's talk about you. 
what made you decide to become a chef? You know, I just really, I liked cooking as a kid. It was uh, something I enjoyed doing. I would do it after school every day. And when uh, eventually I had to, I was, I was traveling a lot uh, after university and I, um, uh, I realized really what I wanted to do with my life was travel, but I had to find a job to uh, fund that travel. And the only thing I liked to do and could do was cook. And so I thought I would put those two together and I'd travel the world as a chef. As it turned out, I came back to New York and went to cooking school and didn't travel for many, many years after that. But uh, up until this uh, COVID-19 disaster happened, I was traveling quite a bit as a chef. Yeah, that must be really tough. I used to, I've traveled a lot too. And I that's the hardest thing I'm dealing with right now is I travel to Tompkins Square Park, which is a local park. <laughs> sit exactly. there and look at the birds. Yeah, I try to pretend I'm in another, in Montana. Um, so can you tell us about, you have two restaurants. You have Dirk Candy. Dirt Candy and Lecker Burger. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about both restaurants? Are they the same? Are they different? They're, I mean, they're the same because I'm the chef at both of them, uh, but they are very different. Uh, Dirt Candy is all about vegetables and that's, uh, we celebrate vegetables. We've been doing it for almost 11 years now. Uh, when I first opened it, I felt that there were no restaurants that really uh, celebrated uh, vegetables. We were, I sort of looked around and I was like, well, there's thousands of steak restaurants and thousands of uh, chicken restaurants and seafood restaurants, but there really isn't a single restaurant dedicated to vegetables. Uh, and I felt like that was a niche where I could, you know, really make my mark and make my millions. I've definitely made my niche, but I have not made my millions yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but it, you know, I really wanted to find a way to celebrate something that I thought was just really undervalued. And, and the more I've been doing it, the more I want to celebrate them. I'm always learning so much more on so many different fronts. Uh, and then about a year ago, well, actually, I guess we opened Lekka maybe five months ago, Lekka Burger. Uh, I, but about a year and a half ago, the idea sort of came up and I partnered with somebody and I, and I wanted to figure out a way to, uh, you know, bring sort of a little bit what, have I, what I did at Dirt Candy into the fast casual world. I, I, I can't do what I do with vegetables in a fast casual way because there's a lot of labor involved right. and I can't right. make it cost effective. Uh, but we thought we could, you know, take sort of the common denominator, everybody loves burgers, and figure out a way to put a, a slight dirt candy spin on it. And actually, uh, one of the things that's most fascinating about the dirt can or the Lekka burger is uh, I had been working with a Chinese food historian, and we were playing around with recipes, and he showed me a recipe for something, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with what we just made, but uh, this is pretty incredible, and, and I want to do something with it. And it was a 900-year-old recipe. Uh, oh, my God. Everything old is new again. I certainly didn't uh, invent all of the parts of the Lekka burger, but I don't think anybody's using the method. And uh, I was like, this will make the perfect veggie burger. And I think it's fantastic. It's, it's Well, I have to say, well, I read an article on Eater and they raved about it. And I was like so bummed. I, I, I apologize. I didn't know the restaurant existed. Uh, so Very it's the first place. First place I'm going when things open up again. I will even no, walk. doing down. delivery. That's the first. That's the first one of my places to open, and hopefully we'll start delivery in just about two weeks. I'm there. I will go down and do takeout. <laughs> so listen, tell me about your cookbook, a graphic novel cookbook. I think it's amazing. I think people underestimate. I was going to write one. I took a course at NYU on writing a graphic novel. I think it's a very underrated and underestimated. People don't realize how popular they are. So what prompted you and gave the idea to do this? About a year, a year and a half into having opened uh, Dirt Candy, uh, I was sort of getting approached with a, with a lot of offers to write cookbooks, and, and I didn't want to write one, to be honest. I was like, I don't see what value I can add. I want to mm. do something. If I do it, I want to do something interesting. I can't figure out a way. And like most people, I cook a lot from the internet. Uh, and I just wasn't sure if there was, a, there was a way I could do justice to our cookbook that would be a restaurant cookbook. And... Uh, sort of an epiphany happened. Uh, I was having chatting with my husband. And we were both like, well, what would the dream cookbook be? And uh, sort of in the middle of an argument, actually, I think we were screaming at each other about it, but that's how all great ideas are born. Uh, and so it sort of just came up that we were like, let's just do it like as a graphic novel. And this, we said the idea and both of us imagined exactly what we wanted. And we imagined the same thing. And it's, it's almost what we ended oh. up with on paper. Uh, there was just this idea that we both had that we could make it really visual. We could tell the story of the restaurant. We had the, I've had two locations of Dirt Candy. The first one was very, very small. And uh, I think the smaller the restaurant, the more bizarre it is. 
And so lots of crazy stories would happen and there would only be me and one other person to deal with it. And we wanted to tell the story of running a restaurant and what it was like to be a, a tiny restaurant and dealing with all the same problems that a big restaurant has, but you do it on the sort of like microcosmic level. Uh, and we wanted to be able to really show the recipes and show them step by step and make it very visual. And just the graphic novel sort of format was perfect for it. I have to say, I never got into your first restaurant. I literally live, literally a stone's throw from it. And I tried a few times. I, I read somewhere and you kicked out Leonardo DiCaprio, so I felt better. I could never get in. It was very small, but it was the talk of East Village. It was, it was the place. It was. It, for, for about five years, we were the hardest restaurant to get into in New York City. And I'm one of the people. I'm proof of how hard it was. Um, so you've graciously agreed to make some dishes using some of the foods that Dr. Lee has recommended. So do you want to tell us about the tomato one, the first one, that we're, the video we're going to show of it, the cooking demo? So I got the same list that uh, everybody will get and Dr. Lee had spoken about. And uh, I just, I wanted to do something really fun, something different that uh, you might, maybe you hadn't thought of beforehand. And that's my job. You know, it's to sort of play around and come up with really interesting ideas. And sometimes they work. I fail all the time. And uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. But uh, yeah, so for the tomato recipe, I, I just, I wanted to take two ingredients that you wouldn't normally really put together or think of putting together. And so, uh, and I wanted to make them simple. Uh, I certainly am cooking a lot right now at home. And if I have to wash another dish, I might cry. <laughs> so, I, I really wanted to keep things for sim simple, but I also wanted to give you all some new flavors. And uh, so I decided to co combine the oyster oyster sauce with tomatoes and make a really fresh, easy salad. Okay, why don't we go into it? Brendan, let's roll tomato salad a la Chef Amanda. So I'm gonna show you how to make a chopped tomato salad with an oyster sauce vinaigrette. This is combining two of the ingredients that Dr. Lee said would really help boost your immunity. So. We'll start with the tomatoes. I'm just going to give them a pretty rough chop. Maybe I'll cut them a little, a little bit more bite size. I'm just going to add them to that plate, which has a little bit of arugula on it. I like baby arugula, but you know, use any green that you have around. We'll do another half of a tomato. Then I like a little bit of onion in my salad, so I'm just going to make a couple of small slices. Maybe one, two, three, and four. Put the other onion away. And I'm gonna sprinkle it over the salad. This is a pretty rustic salad. Then I'm going to take and really use whatever herbs you have. I'm going to use a little bit of parsley, a little bit of mint, just to get a little bit more freshness in here. And then I'm going to make the salad dressing. So I'm going to start with a clove of garlic. I'm just going to crush it and chop it. You can chop it any way you would like. Uh, you can use a zester or a rasp. You can use a garlic press. So 
So here I'm almost turning it into a paste with my knife. Okay, that was finely chopped. I'm gonna take it, put it in my bowl. Then I'm going to take a lemon, a lemon, and uh, making sure not to get any seeds in it. I'm going to squeeze half of it. Then I'm going to add about the same amount of white wine vinegar. I really like the balance of lemon juice and vinegar. I think they provide a very nice, uh, they're very complimentary to each other. Spoonful of honey. Uh, you can use agave, sugar, whatever you have around. Just a little bit of touch of sweetness. And then I'm going to take my oyster sauce. Use any kind you have. Maybe like, that's one teaspoon and two, te two teaspoons. Mix that up. And then I'm going to stream in a little bit of oil. I'm using extra virgin olive oil. This is going to be a pretty loose vinaigrette. I'm not expecting it to be an emulsion. I really like on salads like this where you can taste the different parts of the dressing, the oil and the vinegar and the garlic. I'm going to taste it for uh, salt. Every oyster sauce is different. I just want to see if it needs a little. Maybe just a tiny bit. Then I'm going to whisk it. Again, pour it over. Salad. That's a, the easiest tomato salad I can think of. It's this really nice, interesting flavor to it because of the oyster sauce. That looks so yummy. Okay, I get first question. Where did you come up with the idea? Like, where do you get your creative inspiration to go, oh, I'm going to make a salad with oyster sauce dressing? Like, Well, this was pretty easy, actually, because I had the, the ingredients in front of me. So it's a lot harder when I, I don't have any inspiration and I'm trying to pull things out of the air. But uh, I'm always inspired by vegetables. And, and so I get to start there. And I, I wanted to do something simple. And, and I, I've never made an oyster sauce vinaigrette and I was wondering if it could be delicious and I know you all didn't get to try it yet but it's actually quite good and uh, has lots of sort of umami and, it, and it's salty and rich uh, and it really does a nice uh, job balancing the sweetness and the acidity of the tomatoes and yeah sometimes it just comes together in my head. <laughs> so Jen asks is there an alternative to oyster sauce? I think I saw on the list that people getting used to vegetarian like is that an option is there anything else people could use well, similar? <laughs> um, the, for the health benefits, I'm not sure, you know, right. what would be better, but if you don't want to use real oyster sauce, a vegetarian oyster sauce will work just fine. And then Rachel has a question. She wants to know the best way to clean produce right now. Do you have any tips? You know, um, I've, I've always, I've always brought everything into my house and I've always washed them, uh, straight away. And I've been pretty diligent about that. I'm, have to admit that I haven't done more since uh, this pandemic has started, but uh, I've always done done a really good washing as soon as I've gotten home with anything, not like with any sort of vegetables or produce. I always, one of my old chaps would always scream at us if we didn't uh, wash everything. So he was like, you know, you don't know what happened to that lemon. For all you know, it ran all over the like, floor of the, of the warehouse and you know, you're just going to use it and you're going to put it on the cutting board and you don't know who stepped on that floor. And so I was drilled into my head. So a, a pretty good scrubbing and washing. Just water? Do you use any I'm type of water? But I'm sure other people would disagree with that. I mean, you're the chef. You're the expert. 
Um, so there was an article in the New York Times recently by Gabrielle Hamilton, who closed down Prune in the East Village. And I'm assuming as a fellow chef, a couple blocks of her that you read it. And, and she talked about the struggles of both having a restaurant in New York City and the pandemic. Do you have thoughts like about Dirt Candy, your future, what's happening? I mean, it has to be scary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been pretty terrifying. I think uh, Gabriel Hamilton hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, she uh, certainly talked about what it was like to run a restaurant and be a chef and be an owner and, and then to lose your business overnight through no fault of your own. And uh, I think every single chef, probably a restaurant owner everywhere, particularly if you're an independent restaurant owner, is, is struggling with the idea of how do we reopen? What do we contribute to the community? What's our value? What's our worth? How do we do this? How do we reopen this sort of industry and, and make it a, a better place? Because certainly one of the things that Gabriel Hamilton had talked about was how the industry at the moment isn't really sustainable. We don't offer enough to our employees or really to our uh, uh, owners. Uh, we all operate on very, very slim margins and uh, it's it's not enough to sustain us. And we're just figuring it out. I will say that I had for many years questioned uh, what my value was in the community. I'm not a doctor, uh, but uh, or, or a lawyer or somebody who like, you know, does really good. Uh, but uh, living in a city right now with no restaurants and feeling that the heart of most of our communities has disappeared. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been a really good reminder that we are a place of love and companionship. And uh, it's something that I miss and truly, truly value. Okay, I have to ask you this because I saw this like on three shows last night. What do you think of the people putting mannequins in their restaurants? Have you seen that to fill tables? I have. It was actually something I had discussed on a podcast the day after this all happened. And we quickly realized that we will be mandated to have much less uh, people in our dining rooms. You know, I think if it makes your dining room fun again, I cannot uh, be critical at all. It's uh, one of the things that people like going to restaurants for is the ambiance. Right. And is that sort of like joyous atmosphere and the noise and the clatter and, and you feel like you're a part of something. And um, even if I could operate at 50% capacity, the restaurant I now have to run uh, certainly isn't the one that I want to run. It, it'll be a very quiet restaurant with very few guests and, and you won't get that atmosphere as you would have. And, and so it, it's really hard. I think for all of us, we're all struggling with how do we, how do we put the joy back into restaurants when we're only told we're allowed, we're, we've been told we're only allowed 50% of the joy. Have you, have you thought of, I've uh, mentored a bunch of artists that work around food related issues. I mean that I could see, like if you get an artist to do something at the tables and have to stay empty, you do something like so creative, but I think my concern, especially here in the city, is if you're going to take out 50 to 75 percent of the tables, because if you guys haven't been to New York, like people sit on top of each other, I mean, how are you going to make a profit? Like, have you, have you thought about that? Uh, I guess every, every minute of every day since uh, we have closed, I, I don't know how we will, I don't know how any of us will survive. Um, it, it's almost impossible. We're, you know, we're really going to have to depend on the kindness of our guests. Um, mm. You know, we, we're all turning to takeout and delivery and, and maybe we'll do some dine-in and maybe if we can get some rent relief, I think that would help us. That would be the biggest thing that would help us really in New York City is uh, any kind, something, but just a little bit of rent relief. You know, we're paying full rent on a space that we can only do 50% of the business in. And that's right. a lucky. I, I, there's no guarantees that even 50% capacity I'm going to get 50% of my guests back. Uh, I do think that it's going to be a long time before uh, people feel really safe and comfortable uh, about going out to eat. So I don't know. I think we're all just going to lose it. In my best case scenario, I lose a little bit of money every month going forward. And uh, in the worst case scenario, I lose all my money every month. I mean, I think what's important to remember for restaurateurs um, and everyone else is I know we keep hearing that everyone say we're all in this together and it's in all the ads, but I mean, I helped put together a bunch of volunteers in the East Village to shop for people who can't. I guarantee you that, especially in New York City, especially in the East Village, Lower East Side where you are, the community will come together. I, it, this is like, we have to help each other. Um, it's, it's a bit, it's a... I think it'll be really interesting to see actually what happens, you know, and I, I'm certainly guilty of this. I'm, I'm not a community restaurant. Uh, I'm an international destination. Uh, mm. for many, many years I've relied on tourists. They're, they've been my bread and butter. And while the rest of the city's cleared out, I've been packed during the summer and packed over 
the Christmas holidays and packed when other restaurants are really quiet. And so I, I really think of myself more as a destination restaurant. We're not a walk-in restaurant. Uh, certainly the community comes and likes us, but we're, they don't come two or three times a week. And I have to rethink my entire business plan because now I have to be a lot nicer. <laughs> I need to get everybody back in, in the, in the community. But I think that's a good thing. And I think that's something that I had lost as a chef, really. I, I was cooking for this sort of the, the greater world. And I'm actually really looking forward to cooking for the Lower East Side in the East Village now. And we can't wait to go back. So you're known as one of the, the, the boldest, one of the boldest voices in food. Are there any issues? I mean, I think we just touched on one of the most important ones, but are there any other issues that you think need to be discussed more openly or just need to be out there more? Just support your restaurants. Uh, I think mm -hmm. if you mean, uh, most restaurants are putting up calls to action, call your representative, because really if you want restaurants here, uh, we need uh, we need a little bit more government intervention than we have gotten. And I, I think I used to have a whole host of uh, issues that I was fighting for in the in the restaurant community and, and on the grander stage. And, and right now I'm very focused on just getting restaurants back up and open. And then I'll go back to fighting everything else. I'll, I'll fight for <laughs> women's rights in the, in the industry and putting vegetables right. on the table again and, uh, you know, really making a better industry and employee pay. But... Right now, I just all have to open our restaurants again. I just saw a very important question for those of us that uh, can get to your restaurant. Is there going to be outdoor dining? I think that a lot of people are going to start going back. Yeah, to outdoor we're, we're trying. And that's actually one of the things we've been talking to the city a lot. And so again, call your representative, call your council member. Uh, we'd like to do sidewalk seating. I'm on Allen Street, so I wouldn't say it's the prettiest street in the city. Uh, but we're going to try to figure it out. And we're trying to actually get a lot of park usage. So we have a really nice boulevard that runs down Allen Street and mm -hmm. there's all the, the tables. And uh, if the city sort of continues to allow basically open container laws, which they had relaxed during this pandemic, uh, then we could actually use that outdoor space and use it wisely and really turn the city into something, you know, we, we, I think as New Yorkers, we don't live in our apartments. We live in the city, uh, but where we don't live is on the streets. And I, and I hopefully for the next couple of months, uh, certainly until it turns into winter, uh, we can uh, live on our streets. And, and I think that would actually really change the feeling in the city. One of the, one of the things that's been hard and for all of you who are in New York City at the moment, it doesn't feel like New York. It, it's a pretty quiet, um, lonely place. I walked from my house and, and I live basically in Murray Hill down to the restaurant a couple of times a week. And, and I rarely see uh, people on the street and, and it just doesn't feel like New York. It feels really depressed and we're probably in a depression and it'll probably last for a little bit of a while, but it doesn't mean we have to be in a cultural depression. And uh, if we work a little bit harder, we can actually put the city on the streets and we can still have our culture moving. Great. So we have another uh, cooking demo from you that involves mushrooms and some other things. Do you want to set it up? Anything you want to say about it? Uh, you know, again, I wanted to take a couple of ingredients that you wouldn't think of putting together and, and doing something um, really fun with them. Uh, we at Dirt Candy have a very iconic dish, which is our portobello mousse. I, I wasn't, I didn't want to make that for you all because I think it's complicated and again, too many dishes. Uh, but I love, I love the texture of thinly cooked mushrooms grilled or sauteed in a pan. Uh, just the sort of silky melting your mouth. And I, and I wanted to give you all that texture so you could feel that it was luxurious. Uh, we are coming into the berry season and one of the ingredients was blackberries. And I think we have a really fun trick we'll show you and we're going to pickle them and slice them. Uh, and then as a chef, I always want to give you as much texture as possible. And the pecans were a perfect addition. Fantastic. Brendan, let's go to video number two. So I'm going to show you a pretty unusual recipe involving mushrooms, blackberries, and pecans. All three of those are great for you and they taste really good, but you might not think that they're going to taste really good together, but I promise you they will if you just bear with me. So to start, I'm going to toast couple of pecans. I want to make a little bit of a, almost like a crumble with it. So I'm going to add a little bit of extra flavor. To do that, I'm going to put a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of salt. And I'm going to toast these in the oven at about 350 degrees for about 10, 10 minutes. Okay, normally I would put that in a real oven, but mine is broken. So we're using what we have and it is a toaster oven today. While that is cooking, I am going to make a little bit of uh, a marinade or pickling liquid for these blackberries. 
uh, I'm going to take a quarter cup of water and a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar. And then I'm going to add a pinch of salt and about a teaspoon or so of honey. You can use, again, whatever sugar you would like, any sweetener, um, and really taste your blackberries beforehand. If they're very, very sweet, you don't need to add any extra sugar. Uh, we're still a little bit early in the season here, uh, so mine are quite tart. I'm gonna take this over the stove, turn it on high, and just let it come to a boil. Once it's come to a boil, I'm gonna turn it off right away and pour it on the blackberries and let them sit there until they cool. In the meantime, I'm gonna get my mushrooms ready. I'm using portobello mushrooms. That's what I found at the store, but you can use whatever mushrooms you find. I wish I'd found actually bigger ones. I just learned that the best part of the mushroom is the stem. It has the most nutrients, but unfortunately, my local grocery store didn't have any with the stem today. So I'm just gonna slice them pretty thin. You can certainly do this uh, on a mandolin if you have one at home. turn it once and cut it in half and I think I'll do one more mushroom just to make sure that I have enough to show you what the final dish should look like. Some people don't like using the whole mushroom, they don't like the gills, they don't like the stem, but really it's all delicious and they all add extra flavor. Here that my liquid is boiling. I'm going to pull it off the stove, pour it over the blackberries, and then I'm just going to sit and wait until those are cool enough to release this. Okay, we can get started with cooking our mushrooms. Uh, just enough oil to cover the bottom of the pan. the oil to get a little hot. This is real time uh, recipes. So no food network magic happening here. Okay. I can, I'm starting to see a little bit of smoke, and a little bit of bubbles. I'm going to add my mushrooms and I'm actually going to put them in a layer and then I'm going to try not to move them. Some of them will steam, some of them will soak up the oil. Uh, and we will turn them very gently a couple of times. Okay, I'm gonna let them cook. I'm not gonna do much more to them than that. A little Sprinkle the salt, and I'll come back. My, I'm gonna clean my board up, and then the pecans are ready. Oven. 
going to chop them. If they're a little bit hot, don't worry. Just wait until they're cool enough for you to handle. really what I'm looking for. I like the varied sizes. I'm going to go back and look at my mushrooms. I'm going to spread them out again a little bit. I'm trying to be very gentle with them though. I don't want them to break. I want to keep as many whole pieces as possible. Back over there. And then I'm going to take some of my blackberries. And I'm going to slice them pretty thinly. First thin as I can while they'll hold together. I love the way they look when they're sliced. They're like little blackberry flowers. Almost all cooked. Just trying to get rid of that last little white part. What I like what's happened here is you have some crispy bits, you have some really, really meltingly soft bits. You have the different textures with the stem and the gills. Okay, so we take this over. Now, this is fancy chef stuff, putting it in a mold. You certainly don't have to. Uh, you can just spoon it straight onto the plate. But if you have one, why not? It's a little fun. Even chefs make mistakes. I'm gonna try to pack it in together but not too much because I don't want a lot of the liquid to come out. Okay, then while it's in there, I'm going to add the top crumble layer, pull it off, and then just around the plate, a couple of pieces of our blackberry flowers. So that is a mushroom, pecan, and blackberry dish. I really hope you enjoy it. That looks amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to try it. So listen, everyone, I ask you just to go to Bell McGraw USA and sign up and then we can keep you up to date. But Chef Amanda, I can't thank you so much. Do you have any closing comments, closing thoughts, anything you'd like to say? No, I hope everybody enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was a huge learning experience for me as well. Me too. <laughs> so thanks. So just so everyone knows, we will be emailing all of you, both of Chef Amanda's recipes, as well as Dr. Lee's top 10. If you do not have your email, the best thing is to go to bumagrowusa.com and sign up, and then we can make sure we can get the information to you. We'll also post it when we post this information live. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our next Bill McGraw event is tentatively scheduled for July 14th. 
not 100% on the topic. It might be about uh, talking about how everyone can have access to healthy foods like this. Um, and I just want to thank everyone and a special thanks to Brendan. Brendan is the wizard behind the veil that does all the tech stuff for us. And this is our first event. So thank you. Thank you from everyone at Boma Grow USA. And I hope you will join us again soon. Till next time, be well.